everybody. Oh, give it to me. Give me that energy. Give me that only child understandable energy that I do this for. It's not for the big nonprofit bucks. Hello, everybody. Yay, thank you guys so much for coming out. This is like our maybe our fourth event since the apocalypse, the latest one. And it's so nice to see you all in person. I didn't realize until tonight how many of us have only ever uh, communicated through email or Zoom. And uh, it's like a never-ending high school reunion, although we're meeting for the first time. So welcome. Uh, thank you to Nikki for having us at Art Produce, this beautiful venue that is so wonderful to be in. Uh, we are here for, well, real quick, does anybody, is this anybody's first time in an event by So Say We All? Yay, hi. I will just briefly let you know what we do. Uh, my name's Justin Hudnall, I'm the executive director, and we are a nonprofit based here in San Diego whose mission is to help people tell their stories and tell them better. And we have programs that are open to the public at large, like our monthly VAMP storytelling showcase. And we also have programs directed at populations we feel are talked about more than heard from which is what you're going to hear from tonight with the whole alphabet program. Um, this program has been so fun. We've been running this for, I think we did the math and decided five years now and running since we had our very first dedicated workshops over in Baby Cakes. May it rest in peace from the Hillcrest location. We know they exist somewhere else, but I mean, really, where else could you go to get like a delicious brunch and a ton of great booze uh, in one place? We would meet in their little back patio on a Saturday morning and hang out and write. And um, it was so much fun. It was an opportunity for this community to come together and make friends with each other and talk about literally anything, no taboo, no holds barred, and then find a way to, do, to, tr to transmogrify all of those experiences into the joyful, poignant, hilarious, darkly funny, my personal favorite, experiences directed to the world at large. Um, so we're so happy to celebrate this book that has been so long in the making and to get to meet some of the artists and the contributors who we've been primarily working through the, the coronavirus with online uh, in person and you to allow you our lovely audience to hear from them directly uh, I would like you to I would like to introduce you of course to our program director Jennifer Corley who has really done an incredible job being at the front and helm of this project so please Give it up for the uh, for the real MVP of this experience, Jennifer Corley, everybody. Thank you. Wow, that light is uh, much brighter now that the sun has gone down. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, we welcome you all. And uh, as Justin said, this has this has been such a uh, a journey and a process. Uh, especially, I want to thank the authors who have been ultra patient uh, because every every step of the way, this uh, publication has gotten delayed because of COVID. Uh, so thank you all so much. I'm so glad that those of you who are here uh, can finally see some sort of culmination for your efforts and your patience. And um, so I just want to tell you all about the readers that you're going to see tonight. And I'm going to be giving them a bit of an introduction before each one. Uh, tonight we have with us Kelly Bowen, Joe Farron, Joyce Wisdom, Brad Dyer, and Leo Deckelbaum. So we are going to start with Kelly Bowen. And Kelly Bowen is someone who has been involved uh, with So Say We All for a while now. And she uh, has been one of our VAMP performers, and she's a, a great part of our community. She's a longtime bass guitarist and Berkeley alumna turned writer. Multiple performances in So Say We All's VAMP shows, as well as Poets Underground, hooked her on the written, written word, as well as led to her first poetry publications in Poet, Poets Underground's Fuck Isolation, a tribute to the COVID-19 experience. <laughs> And in the forthcoming 2020 to 21 San Diego Poetry Annual. So let's give it up for Kelly Bowen. Short people got to adjust stuff. No, it's important to get these things right. I always heard stories about the Carney people at the Del Mar Fair. My older brother Mike and I used to go every summer 
We would walk around and around the fun zone, the game operators cajoling us to come try to win their prizes. The ride operators all looked far too ill-equipped to actually make sure we were safe on the rides. Mike always talked about how I shouldn't trust the carnies. They were unsafe and unclean, diseased and absolutely nefarious. As we walked, he would point to those who were missing teeth or workers who were particularly grimy to reinforce why it was imperative to steer clear. They were at best out to steal from anyone gullible enough to fall prey to them and their rigged games. He left the worst vague, but hinted at physical harm and kidnapping because he liked to watch my fear, knowing my imagination would weave horrible possibilities of forced substances, assault, maiming, and of never being able to escape. Even to associate with the carnies could somehow taint me with their foul intentions as if they had some preternatural power of corruption. When I was 17, my friend Steve's band got a gig at the fair. This was a big deal in high school. At the time, my friend group consisted of me, the lone girl, and nine fairly mismatched guys. I used to make jokes about my having all male friends to hide the oddity of the situation from myself. One of the guys was Ed, my best friend at the time. We'd gotten super close, and I thought I could depend on him for anything. Ed and I, as well as two of the other guys, made plans to go to the concert together to support and celebrate our buddy. Steve and I had dated for a few months. Though it had been a while since we'd broken up, I was still infatuated and thus was desperately trying to nurse along a friendship to retain what little I could of him. There was no way I was going to miss his show. We got there early, not wanting to risk being late. Unknown to all of our young minds, playing at the fair didn't exactly mean you'd have a big crowd. Steve's band was book on, booked on one of the smaller stages with bleachers set up flat in front of it. We walked up to practically empty seating with just a smattering of tired fairgoers sitting towards the back using the bleachers to rest their feet. Undaunted, we walked forward and sat in the fourth row so that Steve would be right in front of us. The benches ahead of us were empty. Steve and his band came out and started playing. We cheered with excessive enthusiasm. I was immediately absorbed in their set and so proud of my friend. Then a disheveled figure walked out from behind stage right limping and looking quite dirty. The movement caught my attention and the oddity kept it. It took me a moment to realize it was a woman, only really discernible by her overall petite stature and build and my gut instinct, as she was clothed in the same nondescript jeans and shirt that all the carnies wore. Even at the distance I was from her, there was something alarming about her appearance. She paused alongside the stage and did a quick scan of the sparse crowd. Her eyes landed on me like a homing beacon, and then she moved again. She limped forward alongside the stage, eyes locked on me the whole time. She passed across the front of the stage until she was on the outside aisle nearest me. Still hobbling, she came up the aisle. As she neared, I saw she was not much older than I was. There was a crooked gash across her forehead that was clearly recently scabbed and barely healed. Her bangs were hacked jaggedly as if cut by a toddler. She paused at a moment for a moment at our row, but then moved past to the one behind where I sat with my friends. She sauntered in and plopped herself on, down on the bench right behind me. She leaned forward, legs spread wide in a masculine stance, and started talking in my ear. Hi, I'm Melissa, she declared in an overly low voice to my immobilized self but my friends call me Tiger. She extended her left arm to shake my hand. I was taught to be polite, so while completely confused, I extended my left hand in response. As she reached for my hand, she showed me her right. Hand held straight from her arm, her wrist extended down several inches at an alarming angle. She went on to explain that she'd been in a motorcycle accident the week prior. She'd broken her wrist, but decided the cast was a drag and had taken it off. The limp and the gash were also from the accident. I was suddenly desperate with alarm and clueless as to what to do. All of my brother's stories about the carnies reared up in my mind and now one had me in her sights. I'd just shaken her hand too. I wanted to run, but then I'd be leaving Steve's show and my friends. She asked rhetorically, 
So I see you're here with the guys. Yes, I replied, not understanding. I'm here with my friends. So they're all guys, she pressed. Just guys. She leaned further, for forward, further forward, a gleam in her eyes. Does that mean you do everything guys do? Now, at a mere 17, I'd had a boyfriend or two. I'd also had a girlfriend, though I was utterly conflicted about that and in complete denial about my sexuality. I was a pretty shy teen, not willing to step forward and stand up for myself. I just wanted to watch Steve and the damn band. She was stealing my precious moments with him. I responded only by muttering, yes, they're my friends and I don't really know what you mean. Hoping she would take the hint, I turned back to the stage. She leaned further forward. The motion demanded I look at her again. What I mean is, do you like women? Like, sexually like women? I panicked. She was terrifying. Dirty and injured and deranged enough to have removed a cast? Clearly she would do anything to get what she wanted. My friends didn't know I'd slept with a woman. I'd never intended what had happened with Julie, my former best friend who became that then girlfriend. We'd just found ourselves crossing that line. All I knew was that as much as kissing her, touching her, and being touched by her was exhilarating, it was also shameful and forbidden, and somehow that made me lesser or bad. Young and thoroughly confused, after we'd ceased our romantic involvement, I had compartmentalized those experiences away in a desperate desire to fit in. No, no, I don't like women, I stammered as if she were deaf. Gosh, these are just my friends. I wasn't helping my case in the least. My words only further decried the realities I denied, but which somehow even this carny girl could see. Tiger persisted. She was relentless. Well, you haven't really lived until you've tried everything. You really should. You'd be surprised at what you might learn. It finally dawned on me. She was hitting on me. I'd never been hit on by a woman before, and I was deeply unnerved. Even if she hadn't been a carny, there was nothing remotely attractive about Tiger. Her words caused my past romance with Julie to flash through my mind, replete with details of what we tried, how it felt, and all of my confusion. My sense of shame roared to life. At this point, I gave Ed a look. I was desperate for someone, anyone, to save me. He shrugged and looked at me with a, what the fuck am I supposed to do, in his eyes, and went back to watching the band. He hadn't paid me or Tiger any heed, and if he'd heard a word she said, he didn't care. I was horrified. My best friend had failed me. I was on my own. I could barely think. All the stories my brother told me ran through my head in rapid succession. If I was rude, she'd go back to her people and they'd come hurt me, come hurt my friends. I imagined a horde of large, muscled carnies beating us bloody for my transgression. With my mind, I tried to will Ed to put an arm around me to pretend even for five seconds to be a boyfriend. My panic-stricken eyes beamed at him. He kept his face turned toward the stage, reinforcing my aloneness. Tiger took this all in and brazenly forged ahead. I've tried a lot of things. There's really way more to life than you've seen. You haven't lived until you've made love to a woman. It's amazing. I sputtered inconsequentially, trying to shut her down. I've lived, I've, I've, I've lived, Plenty! My mind was frozen between my fear of her and the realities of my past. That was the best I could come up with. I feebly added, I have lots. I was as ineffective in convincing her to leave as I had been in getting Ed to save me. I slumped in my seat, wanting to melt into its metal until there was nothing left of me for her to see. With a devilish look in her eyes and a wry grin on her lips, she said, you should come to the carny party tonight. It'll be amazing. You have a car, right? Stupid me. I nodded because I did have a car. And who was I to lie even to protect myself? I sat there half facing the stage, half facing Tiger like a lump on the bench. I was afraid to turn away from her, rooted in place. I wanted to run. I wanted to hide, wanted to be anywhere but there. 
The only problem was I was there to see Steve's band. I was there with my friends and I was Ed's ride. I couldn't leave. Where would I go alone during the set? Assuredly, Tiger would follow me. I shut down, unable to walk away, mired in place by the life I'd been bred to live and by the shame I'd tried to bury. She persisted through the rest of the show, wheedling me, telling me how much of life I was missing out on not being with women, how amazing the party would be. I could just come for a bit, then I'd see how it was and would know I'd made the right choice. The entirety of Steve's gig past the third song faded into the background and became a blur. My excitement was entirely burned away by my fear and my abject inability to get her to leave. I was frantic with my need to escape. When the set ended, miraculously, she just got up and left. But I was still terrified. I was absolutely convinced she was watching from the shadows, watching us, that she would follow us for the night and accost me at my car, pleading for a ride and for me to go to the party with her. I was sure she would have a bunch of even scarier carny people in tow to make sure we complied. I was convinced I wasn't safe. I couldn't get out of the fair fast enough. I didn't attend the fair for several decades after that night. It took my marriage to get me back, my failed marriage, in which as my husband and I splintered apart, I'd let myself be swooped up by a woman, even then still fighting my deepest longings. Our only day at the fair was one last painful family outing intended to give our daughter the memory of fun and rides while accompanied by both of her parents. Desire to bring my daughter joy spearheaded me onto the path of facing long-held fears and letting them go. The carny girl turned out to be right. Eventually, years after my marriage ended, I came to realize truly it's women I'm most innately attracted to and that my life is much fuller and complete with a woman in it, but not because of the sex alone. It's the connection, the bonding, and being true to my heart. Tiger was frightening. In many ways, she encapsulated what I feared my sexuality meant, that I too was dirty and disturbing and would be viewed as a deviant not welcome in society. That my friends wouldn't help me made me feel alone and like I'd already been shunned, causing me to push it further down in my psyche. I can still hear the breathy, artificially low-pitched intonation of her voice in my mind as she said, Hi, I'm Melissa, but my friends call me Tiger. It took me years to accept myself as I am and to understand and finally feel that my sexuality isn't shameful and doesn't mark me as inherently repulsive. I wish I'd had the self-confidence Tiger had then and that I have now. The comfort in my own skin, the ability to set boundaries, and to choose who I want in my world, to have simply shut her down with, hi, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. That was Kelly Bowen with her story, Tiger. So next, I'm going to introduce you to Joe Farron. Joe Farron is a podcaster, writer, and sometimes performer. He co-hosts and produces the podcast Fright School, Art Time of the Month, and MFK Ultimate. In 2020, Joe was a part of Binge, a remote performance commissioned by La Jolla Playhouse. Born and raised on the island of Guam, Joe is passionate about issues around inclusion, representation, gender-based violence, the LGBTQIA plus community, and the Chamorro di diasporic identity. And this, in this book, The Whole Alphabet, the story that he's about to read is his first published work. So please welcome Joe Farron with his story, Per Diem. <laughs> It's nine o'clock in the morning on a Sunday and I am rushing into the shower. This is the first day of the first conference on the first trip that for the first time an employer has paid me to attend. I'm rushing to get ready. I shouldn't be rushing. Who schedules a conference on a Sunday at 9 a.m.? 
Sundays are reserved for our Lord Jesus Christ and fabulous brunches. And since I haven't been keeping in touch with the former, I figure the latter should not be forgotten. So I order a delicious room service spread to start my day. Scrambled eggs, bacon, hash browns, and a toasted English muffin with Marion Berry jam because the only jam you should ever need is one named after Richie Cunningham's mother and a side of orange juice to drink. My wardrobe for the day, more like for the week, has been laid out and pressed from the moment my suitcase unzipped. I brought with me three pairs of shoes, options for casual, smart, casual, and dressy, with me on this trip, which caused my check bag to be 6.5 pounds over the limit, forcing me to empty its contents into a spare duffel bag, which I had packed for just this scenario. I shouldn't be rushing. My name badge is placed on top of my notebook and next to my water bottle so I don't forget it. Apparently, you need to wear it to all the time or else they won't let you into the sessions or worse, the lunches. I've even picked out the pen that I'm going to use, a cross ballpoint. Its heavy thickness makes me feel that what I write to be of grave importance. Both the pen and the notebook are gifts from my family engraved with my name, tokens of best wishes for my new job. My conference booklet, already bleeding blue from my note taking, is placed next to a sweater and an umbrella. The forecast calls for rain, though I'll be indoors for most of this trip. You're never fully prepared unless you have an umbrella at the ready. But all of my preparation is turning out to be a waste. I'm still rushing. No, not because I'm worried I'll be late. <laughs> no, I'm certain I will be late if not missing entirely the first session of my first adult conference. I'm rushing into the shower <laughs> because a guy I just met online is coming over to my hotel room. He's coming over at 9 a.m. and we're gonna get naked and he's gonna be here in 10 minutes. <laughs> After landing at the airport the day before, checking into the hotel and exploring the city for a few hours, I decided like I always do when I'm in a new city to check out the local talent. Ironically, around the new year, I had publicly proclaimed the end to my search for a boyfriend. The manhunt was over with no success whatsoever. I deactivated my accounts and deleted all my apps. No more right swipes, no more Adams, no more double tapping jockstrap bathroom mirror selfies, no more headless torsos and faceless cocks only looking for friendship. No more verse tops, NWMs that are VGL, HWP, DDF, HIV neg, UB2, cut and into WS. No more smiles or winks or pokes. No more no fats, no fems, no more mask for mask only. If I wanted any growling or woofling, I'd have to go to Michael Vick's backyard. I gave it all up, cold turkey. But it doesn't count if I'm not in my hometown, right? <laughs> Fuck it, I think to myself, maybe I'll have better luck out here. Maybe the scales of attractiveness are weighed differently in, th in this state. And where I was a six back home, I could be like a seven, eight, or even an out of town nine. And with a press of a button, brrr, glows the grinder off the bench and back in the game. I spent the rest of that night online indiscriminately messaging guys. And when you're this struck by lust, any decent looking pic taken in halfway decent lighting is worth the message. My grandpa was a fisherman and taught me that if you cast enough lines, eventually you get a bite. But after a few hours of unresponsive messages, I was starting to give up. And just as I was starting to give up, I re refreshed the page and I saw a new familiar face in the app. I recognized him immediately. I noticed him from earlier in the day as we were waiting at the front desk to check in. He was tall, at least 6'3" but his posture was slightly hunched forward as, as if all his life he was surrounded by shorter people and ducked down as to not inconvenience them uh, or to make them think any less of themselves. Height is not a requirement for me as much, it is, as much as it is for other people. I tend to like more practical things like a good smile or a juicy butt. I noticed that he had both of these. His most noticeable quality was his hair. Buzz on the sides, nice and tight, with the length on top slicked back. It was also bleached and then colored a shade of blue that was somewhere between serenity and glacier. Not an easy look to go, get away with, but he wore it with such a plum that I could not help but be drawn to him. I thought that he might be just another guest of the hotel, but shortly after the lobby sighting, I saw him again at the first timer's welcome reception. Not only was this tall, handsome man a guest at the hotel, but he was also attending the conference. 
I didn't talk to him then. I was too focused on the unique networking opportunity this function represented <laughs> and thought I would express my desire into a tissue later that evening. So imagine my good fortune to discover the tall man's smiling face staring back at me from my phone, little green dot telling me he's awake and less than 650 feet away. I send him my usual bait, hi, smiley face emoji, I'm Joe, how are you today, and left it there. Before long, I fell asleep and woke up unsatisfied. Checking my phone, I noticed I didn't get a response until about 8.45 this morning. Hi, Joe, I'm Cody. How's your morning going? I saw that he was still online, so I replied right away. Okay, I guess. Uh, say, I, I think we're here for the same conference. Yeah, I think we are. I thought you looked familiar, smiley face emoji. Well, <laughs> this is a little awkward meeting on here like this. Not awkward at all, winky face emoji. I just finished getting myself dressed. Now for escalation. Say, I don't know what your plans are for the day, but maybe we could grab some lunch or something. I'd be down to meet up, winky face emoji. That response would have been enough for me to count this one in the win column, but then it was his turn to escalate. What are you up to now? He, re he typed. <laughs> I replied with a raised eyebrow. Just finished breakfast, nothing like room service on the per diem to start things off right. Cool. Mind if I swing by? Uh, sh sure. <laughs> of course. Here's my room number. Be there in a sec. Smiley face emoji. Which brings me back to rushing into the shower. After having washed all the important areas, I quickly dry myself off and swish with some mouthwash. I put on a sweater and some jeans, an act that is mired in futility as much as it is, as, as much as it is politeness. I realize I hurriedly, I, as I, I realize as I hurriedly straighten my sheets and clean the room service tray that most normal people have this notion that hookups happen under a cloak of darkness, that somehow the night and all of it connotes and the and about the unknown justifies the sabrosa nature of anonymous sex. Two consenting adults should know better than to flaunt their shame craving in the light of day. I guess that makes me a rebel as a half as a glass of a half-finished OJ and remnants of an English muffin are about to witness things that typically take place the evening prior to their consumption. The sheer gluttony of my situation is not lost on me. It was not enough to order a meal of dubious fiscal responsibility, but that I could still fit one more thing inside of me. <laughs> I hear a shuffling outside my door. The tall man knocks three times. He must want me. I open the door, and he is even more delectable from zero feet away. I welcome him in with a flourish gesture that is typically reserved for hosts of HGTV shows. His smile catches my eye immediately. It, is as genuinely it has a genuinely mischievous quality to it. I did not jump on this man the moment he walked in because I am still not sure if I have read in between the lines correctly. I lay on the bed and get comfortable, and he stands there next to me. We make the deferential small talk that you make. I learned that he's from the Bay Area and has a side hustle giving massages. I'm not sure if he gives those kinds of massages, but the rent is too damn high up there. I also learned that he went out last night to a full nude male strip club. I called my husband to tell him I was, uh, what I was doing, he said. Cue record scratch sound effect. He was so jealous, he even told me to get a lap dance. Wow, how understanding of him. Now, I do not have a problem with messing around with a guy that is partnered or married. If they have an open arrangement and they are honest about everything, then what's the big deal? I'm not under any delusion that I'm going to find the next great love of my life on a hookup app. This is for him what it is for me. A bit of out-of-town fun and nothing more. At the inevitable lull in conversation, the tall man looks at me, then at his crotch, and then back to me, smiling his shit-eating grin the whole time. It's this exchange that makes me nostalgic for a time that I was never a part of. When cruising meant going to smoke-filled bars with pitch-black back rooms, the time before online profiles when the only push notifications you could receive was the trade grinding against you on the dance floor and the only guy taking dick pics was Robert Maplethorpe. <laughs> a time 
when a simple look, a glance, a nod of the head was an elaborate semiotic language of desire, it was a time when advances and rejections were not as easily ignored because a flesh and blood person was standing in front of you and not a headless digital image. The tall man makes eyes at me and leads my gaze towards his jeans. I begin to unbutton his jeans. My God, do I love a button fly pair of jeans. One by one until finally I reveal his, oh, wow, wow. <laughs> Yeah, I know, this says the tall man, eyes closing, shit-eating grin disappearing. Get to it. It's 9 a.m. on a Sunday, the first day of my first adult conference for work, and I'm going to miss the first two sessions. Once again, my best laid plans are foiled by a lack of self-control. But I guess there's always tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. All right, next up, we have Joyce Wisdom. Joyce retired from a long career as a nonprofit executive director that included writing many, many, many grant proposals. Her BA in theater served her well after she left the stage as her career required more and more public speaking. Her life reflects the vibrant, diverse commercial corridors in which she lived and worked throughout her life, first in St. Louis, then in Minneapolis, and now in Hillcrest. So please help me welcome Joyce to the stage with her piece, Baby Orchid is a Lesbian. It was the summer of 1967. I was 15. There I was in my mother's house, which used to be my grandmother's house. The house was built in an old St. Louis neighborhood that was once called Little Luxembourg. Grandma died in her bedroom in this house when I was eight. Mother was 51 and always at work in her beauty salon. Her beauty salon was connected to our house but it had its own entrance in front. But instead of using that, her customers preferred to park in back and enter the back door opening into my bedroom. Then they walked through the house to the salon. As a result, though it was summer, I had to be up early, have my room cleaned, have the bed made. Oh, it was disgusting. And Wednesdays? The day mom did most of her permanence, they made the whole house stink. I bemoaned the lack of privacy in our home, and I sure did not like the smells of the permanence. But I was proud of my mother. She was born with birth defects that resulted in her missing one or even two flanges from their middle fingers. Regardless, she went to beauty school after the eighth grade. The school thought she would not succeed, but my grandma forced them to give her a chance, and mom graduated first in her class. Despite the intrusions on my personal privacy, I really liked the hustle and bustle of having mom's customers and friends around all the time. I learned a lot from those women it was like having a multitude of mothers. They gave me advice and they celebrated my successes. Like, do Friday's homework on Friday. Soon you will get your driver's permit, herd your teams 10-2 for the season, or you should be a teacher. And Mrs. Hartman reminded me repeatedly then you were born, the Lime Community Link paper published a story via the headline, Baby Orchid is Born. This is because mom's salon was called the Orchid Beauty Salon. The clipping is still in mom's scrapbook. However, mom and I have been fighting a lot in 1967. It usually went this way. 
No, I am never going to take over the beauty salon. Yes, I'm going away to college. Mom was going through menopause and I was going through adolescence. Hormones were bouncing everywhere. <laughs> Mom would say, my business will be my legacy to you. But like my mother and grandmother, I was strong-willed. I had to stretch my own wings. I was the first in my family to go to college. Other than my teachers, we knew almost no one who had gone before me. I soon discovered there was another reason for my strong urge to get away. I was away at school only a short time before I fully realized I was a lesbian. It's a lot easier to come out from a distance than to come out in what might be a hostile family that you have to live with. But my family wasn't hostile. They said, we don't exactly understand, but we love you. This was and is surprising in Missouri. I was a very lucky young woman. But on this day in 1967, there was yet another angst in the air. Mom was told she had breast cancer and had scheduled her mastectomy. Little did I know that I would be doing the same just 15 years later when I was only 30. She was not happy, happy about that legacy that she left me. But like my mom, we both kicked cancer's butt. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Our next reader is Brad Dyer. Brad was born in Wyandotte, Wyandotte, Michigan. He attended Henry Ford College in Dearborn, where he accidentally majored in liberal arts. So many of us did. He moved to San Diego at the age of 21 and learned the hard way that you can't fill a hole in your heart with Dick. He is now happily married, continues to write fiction, and is currently working on a book of personal essays tentatively titled Sexpectations. So help me welcome Brad Dyer with his piece, Tony. brighter up here than it looks. Um, I'm Bradley Machado now. My husband and I got married recently. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate it. That's bad. <laughs> Alright, so this is called Tony. I still remember when I met Tony, and I always will. The image is burned into my mind as both a fond recollection and a moment of utter regret. I had chatted with him for several days on Grinder, and I was just so intrigued. And the feeling was mutual. We agreed that we would come to the gas station where I worked to meet, and he had sent me pictures of himself. But I was so utterly unprepared for the beautiful man that walked through the door that sunny afternoon in Detroit. His hair was dark, his skin was olive, and his eyes contained a spark that was somehow both calming and exhilarating. He wore blue jeans and white, a white t-shirt, just like the Lana Del Rey song. And when he smiled at me, I melted inside and I felt weak in the knees. We talked outside for a bit by the tow truck on my lunch break, and that night he actually picked me up from work. I thought he was the most charming guy that I had ever met. We spent that night together, and in the morning when he drove me home, he held my hand. At the time, I was not fully out of the closet. I had never felt comfortable with my sexuality. But Tony told me I was beautiful. It made me feel special in a life that I had walked through feeling invisible. I felt noticed. I felt visible. And I finally felt like somebody recognized my particularity. And we would talk for hours. It was the most that any man had ever wanted to know about me. Every single word I spoke seemed to captivate him. And when we fucked, I swear to God, I had never felt so alive. He awakened something inside of me. And for what seemed like the very first time, I felt fucking passion. For once in my life, I felt free. I had buried so much of who I was so deep inside myself 
that I often didn't even recognize myself. But when he touched me, when I touched him, I saw that person again. I felt like I had reunited with some long lost part of myself and for me that was a freedom I had waited a long, long time to find. I had never been in love, but whatever I felt for Tony, that was the closest I had ever come. And seemingly, overnight, things changed. It became evident that Tony knew how much I liked him, and once he knew he had me, I became something he took for granted. Shamelessly, I crawled back every time. When he criticized my clothes, I listened, and I bought new ones. When he criticized my appearance, I cut my hair, I worked out, I moisturized, I shaved. When he made me feel ashamed to be myself, when he embarrassed me in front of his friends, when he criticized my friends, I laid down and I let him. I woke late one night after we had gone out and I overheard him talking to his roommate Ron and I knew instantly that he was talking about me. I could hear him saying they didn't like the way that I dressed, that I didn't have a car, and that he always found up he always wound up falling in love with losers. He told, he told Ron that he didn't think I had any drive, and he didn't think that I had much of a future. I don't know if he thought I was sleeping, if he thought I was at, out of earshot, or if he just simply had no regard for my feelings. But once again, desperate to be wanted, desperate to be loved, I lied in bed and I told myself that I'd heard wrong. Another night, while I was grabbing drinks for us at a bar, I noticed he was caught up in a heated conversation with a young guy, a guy very similar looking to me. I could hear him trying to appeal to Tony. I could hear the desperation in his voice as he pleaded for Tony to please come outside and talk to him. I could see the pain. I could see the fear, the familiar yearning in his eyes as he said, almost crying, Tony, this isn't you. You're a nice guy. How could you do this? And then I heard it. The moment I should have seen as my cue to leave. The red flag to end this one-sided love affair. I heard Tony utter so clearly one sentence over the thud of that bass. Because I'm not a good person. When I approached, he threw his arm around me and he kissed me. And it felt so good. So good that my mind stopped spiraling and all I could think was, he wants me. I could see hurt in this other guy's eyes. I could see his desperation. And sadly enough, I could completely empathize. Tony was breaking someone's heart, using me as a prop to do it. But still, I could not, or would not, look at what was happening right in front of me. That night, I got incredibly drunk to cope with the feeling that I could not shake and I hadn't the capacity to articulate. I felt so hurt. But still, I ditched my friends to leave with him. Uh, we got to his apartment and I let him fuck me. But for the first night since our short acquaintance began, he didn't grab me and pull me close to him. He didn't kiss me. He didn't press his body against mine. Afterwards, he didn't grab my hand or wrap his legs around mine. He simply turned over told me he had to be up at 6 a.m. to go to the gym, and he fell asleep. And as I lie next to Tony, I thought about the value I had placed on him, how much power I had given this individual. I had allowed this guy to dictate how I felt about myself. I had allowed him to use me, mistreat me, and to disrespect me. And still, I felt like I loved him. In my heart, I knew the truth. Tony would never, ever love me. Not for a second. Now I wish I could say that I sat up, pulled on my jeans, collected the shattered remnants of my dignity and left. But I didn't. I turned over to face the other direction and silently I cried. I knew in that moment that I needed to leave. I knew that he didn't want me like I wanted him. But it wasn't until Tony ghosted me that I begun, began to understand how to separate the fantasy of what our short acquaintance meant to me from the reality of what it meant to him. And I used to think that all that Tony ever gave to me was six months of low self-esteem and an irrational STD phobia. He definitely used me, that much is true. But the fact is, I used him too. 
I use his body to make me feel sexy. I use his charm, his confidence, his security to facilitate my own coming out. He broke my fragile and fickle heart, but for that I now thank him. Because he showed me it was possible to love and that I was able to feel attractive and seen. He awoke passion in me for the first time in my life. And after the sadness of rejection had passed, hope emerged. The hope that one day I would find someone and we would make each other feel special, noticed, and beautiful. Our last reader is Leo Deckelbaum, who lives in San Diego, is forever single, and, and that's him saying that, not me, um, <laughs> and has worked as an advertising writer for over a decade. In his spare time, he does storytelling on stage and backpacks in mountain ranges, terrifying his Jewish mother. You can read his children's book, There Are No Monsters Under Your Bed, a storybook for skeptical thinkers on Amazon. So please help me welcome Leo to the stage, reading his piece, A List of Names. I haven't read this out loud in seven years, so bear with me. Okay. Her name is Sarah, and she is my mother. When I was about seven or eight, she told us that if any of her children were gay, she would disown us. It twirled in my mind and it sat there. At the time, I hadn't even gone through puberty yet. I'm not even sure I was conscious of what I was, but it sat there, heavy and fat. A hate-filled statement that seemed out of character. My mother is not a Bible thumper, and she isn't a conservative. She's an East Coast Jew who usually votes Democrat, but in her mind, it was the idea of the other. There were the Jews she surrounded herself with, and there were non-Jews who had different values, but homosexuals were even further away. A different species we had no knowledge of outside of shows like Three's Company that turned homosexuality into a prancing minstrel show. Whatever lewd things homosexuals did, whatever god they worshipped, nothing like that was going to happen in our family. Her name was Jen. She was one of my best friends in high school. She came out as a lesbian when we were 16. I would test my mother by telling her about Jen. Jen has a new girlfriend. Jen is taking her to prom. My mother would shake her head and respond, her poor mother. His name was Josh. He was my other best friend. He loved musical theater. In high school, his parents sat him down and told him that if he was gay, it would be okay with them. They loved him anyway. I was jealous of his wonderful parents. Josh wasn't gay. <laughs> his name was Nathan. He was the first real homosexual I ever talked to. I was 19 and in college. I met him in the international perspectives on gay and lesbian history class that I had taken. I had no interest in international perspectives on gay and lesbian history or the long discourses on whether Willa Cather was actually a lesbian or whether the term history should be herstory. I simply wanted to get laid, and since this time predated Grinder, I had no idea how to meet guys. Nathan and I were the only two men in the class besides the guy who wore a skirt every day and had pink hair. The rest were lesbians and open-minded bi guys with girlfriends. Nathan and I had nothing in common. He seemed like a character to me. He was Wiccan. He had long, spindly fingers, like two menacing spiders that crept and moved when he spoke. I thought he smelled vaguely of old semen. <laughs> Nathan would go on and on about how oppressive and homophobic the University of Maryland was, how the previous day when him and his boyfriend thrust their hands down their pants in the dining room, they were asked to stop. And they refused and were told to leave. I did not like Nathan, but he was a fascinating window into a world I never thought I would touch. 
After all, he had had sex with a real boy, and that small part of me, of him, made him almost a hero to me. I'd never done as much as to hold a guy's hand. I wondered, would I have to be like him to be gay? Would I thrust down my would I thrust my hand down the pants of another boy in public and have it seem ordinary and mundane? His name was Antoine. I met him at the Sexual Minority Youth League in DC. I had been there several weeks, honestly, just trying to meet somebody. He had taken a liking to me and referred to me as she. I had enough issues trying to awkwardly come out. I wasn't looking for anything that skirted gender. I informed him that I was very happy being a boy and if he harbored issues with his own gender identity, he would be best to leave me out of it. He reeked a baby powder and showed me his zippered thong, telling me that he would make me his queen. I wondered if this would be my future. His name was AJ. When AJ showed up to the sport group, he locked eyes across the room. The usual support group banter faded away. This one came home in a dress and his mother threw a shoe at him. This one wrote a 400 page poem about his one night stand. I only saw AJ and that's when I knew we were going to de-virginize each other. That night he came over to watch a movie. We awkwardly sat there and I asked him if he wanted a drink. AJ had never had a drink. So I offered him a shot out of the box of Alabama Slammers I kept in my fridge. I asked him if he wanted to smoke a bowl. AJ had never done that either, so we smoked a bowl. And then we got each other off. AJ didn't feel right to me, but it was a start. A few months later, I met Mark. Mark was the first boy I ever loved. I only wanted Mark. He wanted threesomes. He wanted pure intimacy some nights, and other nights it was like somebody built a wall in the middle of the bed. We took ecstasy together and stared at each other for hours. He finally broke up with me, confessing we were too much alike. I spent the last 15 years looking for the same problem. Its name was Lambda Chi. It was a gay frat in DC. Most of the members were a good 20 years out of college. I never had any interest in frats, but I joined looking for brothers, gay brothers. I learned the Greek alphabet. I went through the motions. I wrote poems vowing I would never end up like them in bars by myself, and I quit after five weeks. I missed being normal. I missed my family. I was pushing them away to look for a new one. But I couldn't tell them. So I lied to my mom when she asked if I was dating someone. I lied when the Gay Society of Maryland sent a rainbow tassel to my house when I specifically told them not to. I lied when the gay porn catalog was forwarded to their house over spring break. I invented all kinds of lies. I wove elaborate tales, big and small, complex and simple. I looked my mom in the eye and I lied freely. And I hated myself for it, but I didn't know how to stop. His name was Damien. He was number three on the list I kept on my wall, my trophy of sexual conquest. We hooked up one night under the giant cross he had in his room. I was glad I was Jewish, but I also knew that one night was all I needed with someone who had a giant crucifix in an otherwise barren room. <laughs> I don't remember the rest of their names. Some I met in bathhouses, some in bars, some at parties. There was one guy I knew as Cockroach who wore a possum skull around his neck. There was another one I blew in the janitor's closet at the Magnetic Fields show. I kept the list to give value to what I was doing. I stopped at 100 because I ran out of room in the paper and I was ashamed. Putting this list on the wall made light of it. I could joke about it on the outside. Look at me, I'm a gay slut. On the inside, I felt dirty. Her name was Luba. I'd known her since junior high. We were in college, and she was one of my closest friends. She told me that she missed me. She never saw me anymore. I was avoiding her phone calls and never came to her dorm room. She wondered why I was pushing all my friends away. I told her about how everywhere I looked, I saw straight people, on TV, on campus, and my family. I just needed to fit somewhere. But I started to wonder if I really had to become another person. I never learned his name. I never talked to him. I was going to another gay bar by myself. I was in Philly for work. The bar was carried shampoo or hairspray. He was standing outside under a street light, waiting for someone, someone to pay him. He was crying. His tears reflected in the light a little. I never went in. I knew that none of this was me. I didn't want to be like him. I was afraid I would. I wanted to find part of myself again. I started composing my coming out letter to my mother on that night on my way to the hotel. It burst out of me. I went straight to my room and wrote for four hours in an insane, possessed way. 
I didn't need to edit or make a second draft. I wrote it all by hand. I refused to get up to pee or where my arm went numb after leaning on it. I just needed to say it and finish. I was worried that if I moved, I would lose it. I would never be able to start again. I needed her to understand because I believed it would stop me from becoming somebody else. My name is Leo and I'm your son and I love you, but I'm tired of lying to you. I started off by allaying what I thought would be her biggest fear. I told her I was never gonna become a Streisand impersonator. <laughs> then I told her that I will never change. I might as well change my eye color and decide to be left-handed. I will never, never, ever be with a woman. I will give you grandkids and most likely they will be brown or yellow or black, but you will love them because they will be your family. I read it all aloud to her and I went on and on. Finally, I finished and I waited. She looked at me, tears in her eyes, and with her voice quivering a little bit, she said, Leo, you still need to date Jews. <laughs> Give it up for Leo Deckelbaum. What a show, am I right? Let's give a round of applause for all of your incredible performers. That was Kelly Bowen, Joe Fajeran, Joyce Wisdom, Brad Dyer, and again, Leo Deckelbaum. Woo! Please be sure to, uh, to, to skirt the edge of social anxiety and tell them how wonderful they are in person in more intimate terms. I also really want to thank all of our volunteers who we depend on here at Soze We All for making everything happen. Tonight's workhorse force was AJ, Aaron, Jacob, Jane, Eric, and Killian. Give it up for them. I also would like you to, uh, if I could ask our board of directors members here tonight, we have Rock, Taylor, Whitney, and Dustin to raise your hands and identify yourselves. Our board of directors would love to meet you. Uh, they're wonderful. They keep everything running. I have a BFA, so I rely on people smarter than me to make everything possible. So please, go introduce yourself to this incredible brain trust that keeps so we all rolling and functioning and thriving. Um, I would also like to beseech you, if you haven't already, please do sign up for our newsletter, Old Fashioned Email Style. There's one at the front right there. Facebook, if you haven't been reading the news, kind of trash. So uh, this is the best way to get a hold of you. We'll only send you an email, a newsletter about our doings, all of which we would beseech you to send us your stories and get involved. There is no barrier to entry with Sosia. We all, a lot of people, the first thing out of their mouth is I don't have a story to tell, and then they tell us a story. And so we have this great network, this wonderful, loving community of writers who are here to make each other better. So if you've seen it and you go on some part of your brain saying, I think I could do that, yeah, you can. And that's what we're here for. So please do get involved. Uh, we'll be doing more readings uh, for the whole alphabet, more reading series at Verbatim Books next month. Please follow us in our newsletter to find out about that. We're going on a little mini book tour as much as we possibly can. Um, and once more, give it up for Jennifer Corley, everybody, for making this whole project come together. Our esteemed program director. Celebrate her hair color. And that was it. So thanks so much. Have a drink. Hang out. We'll be here until 10. Uh, and we love you. Thank you for making San Diego a city we want to live in. Cheers. <laughs>